All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to uh, CS uh, 3510. This is uh, lecture seven on uh, Kruskal's algorithm. Uh, this is a greedy algorithm which solves what's called the minimum spanning tree problem. Yeah, absolutely. Today's on, so yeah, and I, and I went to the window settings too to make sure. There's a big there was a big mute button here that somebody kicked that uh, turned it off last time. But thank you for checking. Um, right. So um, uh, first off, what is a greedy algorithm? And second off, what is a minimum spanning tree? So we need to, dis to define what the setting is. A greedy algorithm is one which uh, you have some problem, and the, and the optimal solution to the problem can be solved by making simple local steps, very small checks. A greedy algorithm is usually the trivial one that you think of first, it turns out. And somehow, if a problem has a greedy solution, then the obvious way to solve it is the answer. Um, not every problem, though, has a greedy algorithm. For example, consider you have like a, um, a like a car trunk that holds 100 pounds. And you want to carry as much stuff as possible, but you only you have four boxes to choose from. Right. So let's say your car trunk can only hold 100 pounds. You have four boxes to choose from. Now, a greedy algorithm would choose either the maximum or the minimum, and then choose the next minimum or the next minimum, or the next maximum, the next maximum, the next maximum. Heuristically, your dad may have told you when you're packing the trunk that you have to put the biggest thing in first, and then you squeeze in all the other things around that big thing, right? Um, but if we formalize the model, that might not work so well. And this is, it turns out this is something we'll talk about later, because it's called the knapsack problem. But if you try the greedy algorithm first, you'll choose 70. You'll try, you do the biggest one first. You have 30 pounds left you can put in. But nothing, none of the other packages you could put in your car is 30. So the question is, how much can you hold in your car if these are the only four boxes and you can only hold 100 pounds? So choosing the biggest one first only gives you, set, you can only carry 70 pounds. You want to carry as much as possible. What about if you try the smallest one first? You try 35, and then you try 40, so that's 75. So you can carry 75 pounds by choosing these two boxes, but then you can't choose anything else. Um, but the optimal solution is not choosing the minimums or choosing the maximums. The optimal solution is something else. These two combined uh, sum to 80. And the optimal solution is actually 80 for this specific instance. You can't carry more than 80. Um, and the greedy algorithms that we just mentioned don't find the optimal solution. So this is an example of a problem where the greedy algorithm does not find the optimal solution. So most problems, many problems, do not have greedy algorithms to solve them. Uh, but it turns out the minimum spanning tree problem does have uh, a greedy algorithm to solve it. And we'll talk about it today. It's called Kruskal's algorithm. Yes? Oh. You'll have to give it a second. All right, so uh, any questions on the greedy algorithm, what a greedy algorithm is? All right, yes? Um, it depends what the, 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 the word basic can mean informal. Is it an informal one? I think, it's, I think a greedy algorithm is basic. Uh, I would agree with that. But sometimes the basic solution is brute force. And not every greedy algorithm is a brute force solution, right? A greedy algorithm you can think of as it looks at only local parts of the information, and it only makes small decisions. A sequence of small local decisions are made, and the output is the entire answer, but that entire answer is also the optimal, is the actual answer. That's the, the, more, the, the stronger definition of a greedy algorithm, right? You just do the best thing you can at that moment at whatever you're looking at, right? Um, so let's talk about the minimum spanning tree problem. An MST, a minimum spanning tree, uh, is a, uh, you have a graph and you're trying to find uh, uh, its MST, and this is in the undirected uh, but weighted uh, setting. So the graphs in this lecture are undirected. Uh, a spanning tree, we don't care about its direction. 
and it is weighted because we want to find its, its minimum. So a minimum spanning tree is three things. It's, first of all, it's minimum. It's minimal. Minimal, right? And so uh, an MST is minimal in the sense that the sum of the weights of the edges is less than any other MST. The sum of the weights of the, we'll call it MST T. Uh, if, we ch if we sum the edge of the weights, we sum, their, uh, we sum the weights of the elements of the tree uh, is less than equal to any other spanning tree. Um, what does spanning and what does tree mean? Uh, an MST is spanning every edge of, excuse me, every vertex of G touches an edge of T, right? So you have some graph G, you consider its minimum spanning tree, which is a selection of its edges. Um, T is a selection of edges from G. You choose some of its edges, and it's an MST if the three things hold. It's minimal. The sum of the weights is less than any other, any other spanning tree. It's spanning. Every vertex of G touches an edge of the spanning tree. So the spanning tree spans. It touches everything, right? Uh, and then it's a tree. Now, what is a tree? There's many equivalent characterizations of what a tree is, right? Um, a tree, a graph is a tree if several things are true. Um, it has v minus 1 edges. That's equivalent. Uh, if it's acyclic, uh, or for any uh, u comma v and t, there is a unique path. Uh, u to v, right? You guys should have great knowledge of what a, uh, of a tree is, being this is a third year computer science course. Uh, everything is trees, nothing is trees. Um, and the following three are equivalent characterizations of what a tree is in the undirected setting. Um, quickly, we can show, like if we call this like one, two, three, four, we can uh, show that um, like uh, not four implies uh, not three, just to kind of give you a hint towards this. Right, so suppose that uh, u and v are in some MST, not even MST, just simply a tree. Suppose there's u here and uh, v here. And suppose that there is not a unique path from u to v through the tree, but somehow there's two paths. Well, guess what? Now you compose those paths, you get a cycle. Right, so uh, th those two properties follow each other. Right? Any questions on the definition of a tree? We all know what a tree is. Excellent. Yes. Um, oh yes. Let's assume the graph is connected as well. So the, the the point of the MST is actually Kruskal worked at Bell Labs, and the problem he wanted to solve was he wanted to um, minimize the amount of wire and therefore money that was spent by his corporation to connect all the houses. So. The edges in this scenario like, don't exist. You just make an edge for every possible pair of houses. right? And the weight of the edge is simply the distance between those two locations. So in, this, in his specific setting, the graphs were, in fact, dense. Um, and it is true that if a graph is not connected, it does not have a minimum spanning tree. Right? There's no edge to connect two components. There's not, there's not a, it has a minimum spanning forest. You can make a, a, a tree per connected component. But we don't care about that. We care only about uh, in, the, in the connected setting. All right. Um, so we understand the point of the MST, yeah? This? Uh, the negation of 4 implies the negation of 3. So the following 4 are equ equivalent. Uh, a graph is a tree if it has v minus 1 edges. Or if it's acyclic, or uh, for any u, v, and t, there's, an, there's a, four things that are equivalent to each other, turns out. A graph is a tree if any of those are true. And if any of those are true, then a, then a graph is a tree. And any of those imply any of the other ones, right? But just simply should kind of demonstrate why they're connected. Uh, that's true, right? 
More questions? Awesome. Yeah? Uh, because in the sense that you're trying to minimize the amount of wire, you can send things both ways over a wire. It's not a one-way toll road, certainly. And uh, an MST is not really about direction. It's not really about a shortest path to something following directions. It's simply about the minimum cost it takes to set up a city with infrastructure. And that in itself is, is not a very directed sounding setting, right? All right, uh, let me give you a graph and then we'll, we'll see if we can compute the MST of it. Okay, uh, so this is a graph, and we are going to compute an MST for it. And uh, without yet describing what Kruskal's algorithm is, I'm just going to draw what the MST is, just to give you an idea. And I'm going to highlight those edges in blue. So what I've colored in blue here, I claim is an MST of this graph. And it's a selection of the edges. And we notice it's acyclic, yes. Uh, it is a tree, yes. Is it spanning? Well, every vertex is touching some element of the tree. There's no vertex that's not connected to the tree. And through the MST, you can go from any node to any node in a unique path. You can get from here to here uniquely. There's only one path through the tree, right? So it's spanning. It is a tree. Is it minimal? Now, that's the hard part, actually, to prove that Kruskal's algorithm outputs, it certainly outputs a minimum a spanning tree. How do we prove it outputs a minimal spanning tree? That's the difficult part. And here, it's not even obvious why this is a minimal one. Perhaps if you look at the other edges, they seem to be quite large, 12, 14, 20, 23. Those seem to be kind of heavy. And all the edges in the graph seem to be less than that. So it, it, you would probably guess that's a, a, a minimum spanning tree. I'll tell you that it is the minimum spanning tree. Um, but the way I computed the minimum spanning trees, I just simply chose the edge that was the smallest, and then I added it to the tree unless it formed a cycle. And that's all Kruskal's algorithm is. That's, it, that's, that's all of it. Um, oh well. So here's the, here's the trivial implementation of Kruskal's. Uh, sort the edges of E by weight. For uh, E is equal to UV in E. So you choose the smallest. You're going to look at the smallest edges first. Um, and we'll say even like uh, T takes on the empty set. Uh, if uh, T plus E uh, contains a cycle, uh, continue. Else T takes on T plus E. Right. So simply, you just add an edge to the graph. This is a, we'll, we'll, we'll do a better implementation of Kruskal's using a different data structure. But you simply sort the edges by weight. Smallest first, ascending. Then you choose the smallest edge each time that has not yet been selected. You add it to the tree. And if you add it to the tree, then uh, you just check if it has a cycle or not. If adding the edge creates a cycle, then don't add it. But if it doesn't create a cycle, great, add it to the tree. And I claim this outputs an MST. Yes? Ah, great, out great question. Fantastic question. How do you know if it creates a cycle? You run cycle finding through DFS. 
Yeah, so let's talk about, this is loose English, it's not really an algorithm. Let's, let's talk about uh, what the complexity of this is. So sorting E by weight takes what? E log E, right? Then uh, for each edge, you run a DFS uh, if that edge adds a cycle to it. So it might be like E times uh, V plus E, where V plus E is the cycle finding part. So for each edge, you run a cycle finding algorithm check. Uh, and that's going to get you like uh, E log E, O of E log E plus O of uh, EV plus E, which is going to be like uh, E squared, right? Because uh, V is always less than uh, E squared, right? So that's EV plus EE. So mm, not the best runtime, to be honest. Um, and we do kind of a lot of cycle finding. Uh, and, it's, and this is part of the beauty, I think, of uh, greedy algorithms is how do we, the, the, the trade-off with, with greedy algorithms is that we're going to, this is, this I claim outputs an MST. And it seems ridiculous, like this seems like a very introductory solution to this, what seems like a difficult structured problem. But I claim this will output the MST. So proving that a greedy algorithm is correct is actually quite involved because of how simple it is. So there's a trade-off there you have to make. Yes? I could do EV plus E squared, but EV should be less than. I'll just do it for simplicity. I'll do it. Yeah, fine. Yeah. Sorting, you have to first sort the edges by weight. Yeah, merge sort, right? E. Here, I'm mixing up notation here. By capital E, I mean the set of edges, but then I also mean the, the size of the set of edges, right? More questions? We, we kind of get, get that this is the algorithm, but we don't maybe understand why it works. Uh, certainly, does it output a tree? Yes, it does output a tree. Because um, it checks, it, every time it adds, it adds, it makes sure it doesn't create a cycle. Uh, is it minimal? Well, it does choose the smallest edges each time. So maybe, it, maybe it's minimal. And is it spanning? Well, that's not obvious from the code, that it, every vertex touches an edge of, of, of the MST either. Um, so proving Kruskal's algorithm is kind of, the correctness proving of Kruskal's algorithm is, it takes, uh, it's a little involved. Um, but again, this runtime I'm not too happy with. So let's try and uh, re-implement Kruskal's algorithm uh, with a different data structure because we redo all the cycle finding. And you don't really need to redo all the cycle finding if you can keep in memory a little bit of the information from previous quote unquote cycle finds. So if you just keep track of a few things, you don't need to repeatedly run cycle finding, right? And uh, to do this, we're going to implement something called union find. Have you guys seen the union find data structure? Do you guys remember the union find data structure? The union find supports two operations, union and uh, log, of, log time, we'll say log of n, and then find, also in log of n. So basically, union find has a partition of some objects of a domain, and it can find an element, so like let's say you give an element, it'll tell you which component it's in, and it can union two components. So it partitions a space of objects into uh, a partition, into disjoint sets, and then it unions them together, or it can tell you which one's in which. So for example, if you had this object or something, the unions might be like this, right? Excuse me. Right. So those three objects in this one, those three objects in this one, and then and if you say, where, where is an element v, it'll tell you it's in this one or this one. And if you say, uh, that's what happens when you call find, it'll, t it'll return which component it's in. And if you say union it'll, of two components, it'll combine them into one big component. Right? Those are two primitive operations that union find supports. Um, it uh, is implemented, I think, with like a binary heap. That's why these both take log time. Uh, they're stored in, in a tree. So what we're going to do with union find is we're going to keep edges that have a path between them in the graph. Uh, we're going to keep, excuse me, not in the graph, but in the tree. 
We're going to keep them in the same union component, the disjoint set. And then as we, as we uh, add edges to our graph, we're also going to merge our disjoint sets together until we have just one giant dis dis disjoint set. So to g I'll give you the algorithm, and then I'll give you uh, an execution of this algorithm on a non-trivial graph. So, yeah. Oh, yes, thank you. We're going to first call make set on each uh, vertex v. So each vertex v at the beginning of the algorithm is going to be in its own quote unquote set. So each set is going to contain one element. The set of sets is going to contain as many vertices as there are. So x is going to be a set of partial solutions. Uh, t is going to be the output minimum spanning tree. But x is going to be a set that we add edges to, which is in progress towards uh, an MST. And uh, we're going to sort e by weight. Um, so we're going to pick the smallest first. If find of u does not equal find of v, uh, x um, takes on x plus uh, e. Uh, union find of u, find of v. So here's what happens. You sort the edges again. Uh, you choose the smallest edge. If find u does not equal find v, this is the step that we did cycle checking. But what we mean by find of u and find of v, we mean if, if find in u and find of v are in different components. So if find u, which is a component, and find v is a component, if they're not equal, then we know find that u is somewhere over here and v is somewhere over here. right? So currently, st that's in progress, which is x, we know that there is no path between u and v currently. So adding this edge, uv, would not form a cycle. So we have found a faster way uh, than cycle finding for this step. right? So what's the time complexity of this one? And then simply, after you've added the edge together, if you add this uv, uh, then you simply uh, combine both disjoint sets. right? Before we get to the runtime, any questions on the union find about what's going on in the background? Yeah. So u and v, if find so if u is here, find u is here, the set of things that are currently in the union find data structure. V is here, find v is here. If find u does not equal find v, that basically means they're not in the same immediate set component. They're in different bubbles. Exactly. And in fact, if they were equal, if find u did equal find v, we would know that we've previously added a path which connects u to v. Right? So adding the second edge, e, would actually form a cycle, because there's already a path from u to v. That's what that keeps track of. Then after we've done that, we combine these together, because we've added this edge, u to v. So now there is a path from u to v. And everything that's already in the connected to u and everything that's already connected to v, there now is a path between those two. That will be more, much more clear as we do the example as well. Yeah? This little circle, yeah. That's find u. That's find v. This is the union of find u, find v. Yeah, and again, this will make. Uh, there's a good visual example of this in a second. Yeah. Ah, one of the benefits of working on an undirected setting is that there's a path from v to u, and in an undirected graph, there's a path from u to v. Yeah. Uh, this is not a data structures course. I'm assuming you already know those things, and there's multiple ways. So when we do use a data structure, it's in an interface way. You should. 
uh, know that you could swap it out for different implementations of a, unit, of a union find. And speedups in union find, uh, different implementations will speed up the algorithm. This is the one with the binary heap. So how would you, well let's, we can, then we measure the runtime in terms of the basic operations of our data structure. Um, so what is the runtime then? Um, well you're going to sort E by weight, so that's going to be E log E. Right? Um, and then you check find u, find v, and that's going to run uh, for every uh, vertex, right? So that's going to be for each edge, that's going to, we're going to run to, uh, for each edge, you're going to run a union call, which is going to be e log e, right? So the whole thing is just simply going to be e log e, right? For each edge, you're going to run find. You're going to run find, and then you may possibly run a union. So for each call, it's going to be e log e. Yeah? The union is the log of, ah, so it actually doesn't matter, right? Log, I claim that O of log B is equal to O of log E. V does not equal E asymptotically, but log V equals log E asymptotically. Why? Yeah, so V you can upper bound by E squared, which is just 2 log E. So you can upper bound log V always by log E. So writing log E is basically the same as writing log V, right? For the big O being an upper bound, not necessarily strict. So it, it turns out it's the same, right? And usually you want to, and you could write E log V here, and it would be correct. But I'm going to write E log E simply because it makes it look like, wow, look, the, uh, the only expensive part then is the sorting, right? Because that's the, that's the time it takes for the sorting. So this is this whole thing is just then uh, O of E log E, or E log V, if you will, right? right? Yes? So we run for each edge, we run two, two fines or a union, and a union, possibly and a union. So for each edge, you run a union find. And we know union find takes log time. Log E, uh, log V, but we know log V is log E. Yeah, that runs in log of V time, that runs in log of V time, and then that runs in log of V time. So that's 3 log V, which is just log E. Yeah. More questions? This is, uh, I think union find is confusing uh, without looking at a, a picture of it. So let's just do the example. Any more questions on just the implementation? So we, we begin the algorithm this way. Um, and I'm going to do each step of the algorithm with a different color. So first we run make set on each vertex v. So each vertex is going to be in its own bubble. This is the initialization part of the algorithm. Right? I like to think of union find as osmosis, where you put things into bubbles, and then you join the bubbles in a specific order. Right? Now we're going to, by Kruskal's, we're going to sort the edges, and what are we going to sort them to get? We're going to get two, two, four, seven, 7, uh, excuse me, 2, 2, 3, 
uh, two, two, three, four, uh, seven, seven, nine, and eleven. Right. That's what happens when, when we sort the edges. I haven't denoted which edge is which, but perhaps you can see the graph is small. All right. So we're gonna by Kruskal algorithm, we're gonna choose the smallest edge first. Let's just choose this edge a to d. Right. So we're gonna choose edge a to d. We determined that find u does not equal find a v. So we're gonna merge those two components. You're gonna union them, but then we're gonna add an edge in our graph x. So we're gonna do like that, but then we're gonna do this. Right? Now we need to choose the next smallest edge, which is going to be this 2. It's going to go from C to D. We determine that find of C is not equal to find of D. So we're going to add that edge in, and we're going to merge those two components. All right, the next smallest edge is 3. But if we notice, find of A and find of C are in the same component, right? By finding in the same component, we know there's actually a path between them already, the way we've structured the union find. So we don't have to determine a cycle check between A and C. We have to just determine if find of U is, is equal to find of E. Here, find of A is equal to find of C. And we know that that's true. So we simply do not add them uh, together. Awesome. So we skip that edge, right? The next one is 4. Uh, and we determine that find of B does not equal find of E. They're separate. So we add an edge to them. And then we do our union. Right? So we have two components now. One is of two edges and one is of one edge. Now we add, we have two choices. Uh, we chose four. We have two choices for seven. Let's just suppose we chose A, B. Uh, and notice that find of A does not equal find of B. So these are in different components. So we add an edge there, and then we union together those components. Um, now uh, we have seven the second seven of find of C and find of E. And we see, well, C and E are in the same component. There's a distant path between C and E. So we don't add that edge. Then we try edge uh, of value 9, which is going to be from B to D. And we see, actually, there is B and D are in the same component. There implicitly is a path between those two. So we don't uh, add that edge. Then we try edge 11, which is from uh, D to E. And we know that there's, because they're in the same component, there's also a path between them, so we don't add those that way. Um, and then we're done. Yes. Yeah, you could do. You could say until we add v minus one edges, but then it's actually not called Kruskal's algorithm anymore. It's called Prim's algorithm, which is almost an identical algorithm, but just we sp denote those two differently for this way. But yeah, you could certainly do that. The same thing, right? And you could have noticed. Well, I just add, I had v vertices. I added v minus one edges, so it has to be a tree. So I'm done. You know. Um, right. Now, we didn't stop at v minus 1, though. We kept going, because that's what the definition of the algorithm did for us. Uh, and notice, again, the, the, the important part about how union find works. It allowed us to just simply check if find u does not equal find v. And implicitly, we've kept a path between those two vertices, if that was true. Right? We know that there's a path between here and here, because you can go this way through x. But we didn't have to actually perform the cycle finding. We just had to simply return if this path is equal to this path. 
excuse me, if this union, if this, this find equals that find, right? And that does, that's where, where the speed up uh, comes from. Um, another thing is that the, the edges drawn here are not the data structure of the union find. The data structure of the union find is somehow organized how it does the find logarithmically and the union logarithmically. It's done through a binary heap. This, the edges drawn here are x, which is the in-process uh, minimum spanning tree. So we understand why union find works. We still haven't proven the algorithm is correct, why it does output a minimum spanning tree. But any questions on the correctness of the algorithm? And not the correctness of the algorithm, excuse me, but on the algorithm itself before we prove its correctness? We all kind of, it's kind of easy, right? Kruskal's algorithm is maybe too easy. Good. Have you guys seen Kruskal's algorithm in another class? Okay. Um, what class, if I can ask? 13, okay. All right, let's prove uh, what's called the cut property, and then we'll allude to why the cut property uh, uh, proves the correctness of, uh, of Kruskal's. A cut in a graph is a partition of its vertices and the edges that span between the partition. So if you have some graph G, A cut is a specific partition of the graph. Right? There's more than one way to cut the graph, but this cut has two edges, E1, E2. So the cut, this specific cut, we would denote as what is in the left, what is in the right. So we say we would say the cut here of L and R is equal to E1, E2. Right. This is the cut of a graph. A cut is the way you split the edges and what edges cross between them. Right. The point of the cut property is the following theorem. With the cut property is the following: uh, for every cut of G, every single way you could cut the graph, the smallest edge. By weight, the, so the, not the 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 the, weight, the edge of the cut with the least value, the smallest edge of uh, every cut is in some uh, MST. Right. What is this saying? If you take a cut of the graph, you partition it, except the things that are crossing it. You only look at the edges that cross from one left, what you've denoted as a left half, to what you've denoted as a right half. Uh, the edges that cross it, the, the edge with the least weight, must be in an MST. We'll prove that, but before we do, I want to talk a little more about cuts, because uh, I had an interesting application of them recently. So I was doing this knitting project, and you got like uh, a ball of yarn, like this, right? Looks like that, right? And the yarn has two ends to it. One end is at the top, and you usually don't want to grab that end, because then when you pull that end, the whole thing starts bouncing everywhere. So you don't want to grab the outside end of a ball of yarn. So what you do is you want to grab the inside end. But then to grab, if you have a big ball of yarn and the ball of yarn is like that big, uh, how do you grab the inside end? What you do is you stick your hand in there and you grab some of the guts and then you pull out the guts. And uh, so you just grab the inside and you pull it out and it's going to look like this. There's going to be a bunch of strings or whatever and there's going to be a bunch of this. And it's pretty big and then how do you know that you grab the end? And usually you don't know. You grab the middle and you pull it out and then uh, like then you've messed everything up. The inside is now all spilled out and it's ugly. And maybe you haven't grabbed the end. Maybe you just grabbed a couple loops from the inside the middle. So how do you determine if you've grabbed the end or not? And then here's a cool thing. I, I, uh, someone else will probably figure this out, but I, I realized a quick counting argument to know if you've grabbed the end piece of yarn or not. You simply grab some of the guts and then you count the number of edges that go between the guts and the rest of the skein of yarn. And that forms a cut of the graph.
right? You know one of the endpoints is still on the big piece. And if the number of edges going between the cut between the guts and the and the rest of the skine is even, then you know that both ends are in the same piece. You know both that both ends must be still here. So if you count, you don't have to untangle all this. You can simply count the number of connecting pieces. Notice that it's, if it's even, then you know it simply must be a loop because everything that goes that way must come back, right? If there's only two ends, there's not a third endpoint, right? It's only one long piece. So if there's, if, if there's two things, you know that it must look like this somewhere, right? So you know that there's loops if it's even, but if it's odd, you know that, there's a, that you found an end of the yarn. So kind of like through binary search, then you could pull out the guts of that. If the number of pieces is odd, you can then find uh, another, you can find the end easier. But if it's even, you have to push it back in and not untangle it. But if it's odd, you know you can untangle it because you found the end piece, right? So this was a, 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 an application of the, I was thinking about the cut property this weekend. This is an application of the cut property uh, in, a, in, a, in a more applicable setting. Uh, partitioning the graph and then just doing a little bit of math can tell you a lot about the structure, it turns out. So not too related to uh, Kruskal's algorithm specifically, or the, the cut property of a minimum spanning tree, but still kind of an interesting, interesting anecdote, right? All right, let's get on to proving the cut property. Any questions about the cut property first before we get into this? Yeah. Every single cut, not like any combined cut. But if you take the cut, take a graph, cut it, the smallest edge of that cut must be in some MST. Take a different cut. That smallest edge, which may be a different edge, must be in some MST. That smallest edge must be in some MST, and so on, right? So every cut, the smallest edge of every single cut must be in some MST. And we're going to define a cut again by, by two halves L and R that partition it. So R is everything that's simply not L. And the cut are the edges that cross from L to R, and it's undirected, so R to L, and so on. Uh, and we define L and R to not be empty either, right? So you can't have it one half empty and the whole thing a cut for simplicity. A cut must contain at least one vertex on the left or the right, right? Any more questions on just what a cut is? What, what, uh, what the, what, uh, we'll prove the cut property, and then we'll prove why the cut property implies the correctness of Kruskal's. But any questions just on the cut property? Yeah? So E, for example, this cut has two edges, E1, E2. The one of the least weight, the lightest edge. Exactly. And a graph, again, may not, the MST of a graph is not even necessarily unique. If every edge weighs the same, then certainly it's not unique, right? Uh, well, that's sort of the difficulty in proving that. We have to get around that, right? More questions? Yeah? Oh, just for simplicity, we're going to assume that you partition it in half. You've quite, quite literally cut it into halves instead of thirds, right? All right. Um, the proof is mostly visual. So suppose we have uh, a cut of the graph, uh, but we're going to look at the MST of it instead. Suppose you've computed the MST of a graph. Um, and for simplicity, our picture is only going to have two edges. Right. So suppose this is kind of what our graph looks like uh, with its MST T been, be, have been computed. 
Um, and notice that if you have two edges of a cut, if you have some cut and you have two edges of a cut being part of an MST, it might imply that there's a cycle in the graph. So if you consider the MST first and then you take, the cut of the take a cut of the graph, looking at the MST, because the MST is spanning, it's going to, there's going to be a path if u and v are in just one part of the cut. There is a unique path from u to v. Now if, MS, if u and v are in the left half, there's also a unique path to u and v. If you take a spanning tree and you cut it, and both the vertices are in one half or the other, then you know there's still a unique path. So it's still a spanning tree for both those parts. But if there is a path this way, if there's two edges of this cut in, the, in this specific setting of the, of the graph, then there's a cycle. Because you can go from here to here through one edge and then come around the other edge, right? Through the kind of visually about w w the way the spanning tree is set up, right? So what we want to prove is that uh, if a T is an MST and X is an in progress, X is a subset of, t of T, uh, I think of X as an in progress. Uh, set towards an MST. And E prime is the lightest edge of a cut, then uh, X plus E is in progress to some MST T prime. So statement of the proof takes a second to digest. It's not as complicated as the proof itself, it turns out. But suppose x is some in-progress set towards an M to an MST t. So the, tree, the graph has an MST t prime. x is an in-progress set. x is the set of vertices, as, excuse me, yeah, the set of edges as we add edge, add edge, add edge. It's not all the way to an MST, but it's on the way to an MST, right? Kruskal's is a greedy algorithm. So we need to, all we need to prove is that the next edge is a correct decision. And if we do so, then the answer could only be a correct decision. That's sufficient for us to prove the correctness of a greedy algorithm, right? But proving the statement will, is not, the statement itself is not trivial. What we mean by this is we, if E is the lightest edge of any cut, so the edge of least capacity, then we want to prove that X plus E prime is on its way to an MST T prime. Now, why T prime and not T? A graph may not have a unique minimum spanning tree. We just want to say that it's on the way to some MST, not necessarily the same MST. We're using T to denote that X is, was in progress to an MST, and we're using T prime to denote that X plus E prime is in progress to an MST, right? They don't have to be the same MST. A graph may not have a unique MST. But as long as you begin, with, you're in progress to an MST, you add the lightest edge, you're still in progress to an MST, that's sufficient, right? Any questions on just the statement of the way we're going to prove the cut property? Do we agree that this proves the cut property? Yeah. Yeah, so suppose x only has five edges, but the graph has a million nodes. Right, x is uh, updated several times. If you look at the x in the definition of Kruskal's, x is a set, but it begins empty. So then you add an edge, and then you add an edge, and then you add an edge. And then when you're done adding edges, you stop, right? But it's, suppose we're not stopped. We want to prove inductively, actually, it's a proof by induction, that the next edge you add is also still a correct decision, right? So um, suppose uh, T is an MST, and let uh, E be the lightest edge of some cut. Uh, then if X plus E 
is a subset of t, then we know then uh, we're done, because we're still in progress uh, to an MST. So suppose then that uh, x is a subset of t, but uh, x plus e is not a subset of t. We want to show that uh, x plus, uh, excuse me, x plus e is still in progress to some MST t prime, right? So consider the fact that x plus e is not part of the original MST t, but is in progress to an MST t prime. So what we're going to do is we're simply going to form t prime. Consider t, uh, t and the cut of e. Uh, then uh, t has some edge in this cut, e prime, right? One of these is e, one of these is e prime. Think of it that way. Uh, so uh, t plus e uh, has formed a cycle and is not a tree, right? Do we agree that if we take t, which is a minimum spanning tree, and we add some edge, which is the lightest across some cut, but it's not part of that current spanning tree, if we add e to t, we have formed a cycle? Do we agree? You add, actually, if you take any tree and you add an edge to it, you'll form a cycle. You have v edges, and it's spanning. It's connecting all the, all the edges. The only edges left are ones that are already in the graph. So there's already a unique path from u to v. Adding an edge forms a cycle between u and v, right? So t plus e forms a cycle, and it's not a tree. So consider t prime, which is to be t plus e, but then you subtract off this edge e. So this is, you add edge e, but then you remove edge e prime, which was already part of the MST, right? Yes. Yes. It's the one, we want to prove that t prime is also an MST, right? So we're going to take t, we're going to remove an edge, we're going to add an edge, the lightest edge of this cut, and then we're going to remove an edge uh, that was already in the cut. Because actually, for the by the way, it, it's not true that if you have an MST and you cut it, that there's exactly one edge across every cut. That's not true. But what is true is that there is at least one edge across every cut. Otherwise, it's not spanning. There's no path from left to right. But it's not true that uh, you could consider this example. right? Right. That is two edges across the cut. It's not necessary that there are ex there is exactly one edge across a cut. The cut probably says the lightest edge is included in the cut, is included in the MST. Uh, it doesn't say exactly one edge is in the cut, so there may be more than one cut. But we know that this E prime exists because because uh, this E prime is in T. It's some part of it's part of the cut, right? It has to exist, otherwise the graph is otherwise the tree is not spanning. Any any questions on just t plus e? Yeah. So t is some MST. T plus e is where we add the lightest edge of a cut. We just we choose a cut and we add the lightest edge, and we add it to t. We add it to e. E is, we're supposing that E is not chosen by the MST, but it's the lightest edge of some cut. Then we add T plus E, and we notice that it's a cycle. So we're going to remove some other edge, E prime, that exists in the cut. So we're going to, T prime is going to be T plus E, but then remove E. Yeah? Yeah? So how Right, so we don't, we don't know where we're cutting it. We're doing it for all cuts. So consider some lightest edge of some cut. That's enough to prove the statement. We're going to consider a cut and some lightest edge E that was not in the MST. And we're going to see what happens when we add it to the MST. Right? Does that make sense? More questions on this part? Yeah? Yeah. 
Yeah, but let's consider locally one cut for one edge, right? We want to show that adding this edge in to x is going to be in progress to t prime. So here's, a, here's another way to think of it with the picture. Uh, we, there was some edge in the cut already, OK? We added the second edge in the cut. If we delete, if we add both edges of the cut, though, because the graph was already a spanning tree, then we know it spanned this, we know it spanned this, and there was two paths across it. So there was a cycle, right? Because the, these were connected here and these were connected here. But uh, if you add back in this edge, you make a cycle, not good. So what you do is you keep this one, but then you remove that one. Exactly. You're assuming that the one that you're adding in is smaller and that it wasn't selected by the MST algorithm. The structure of the proof is you're supposing that there was a smaller one that you're removing. Yeah. Again, kind of not trivial, right? Right? So T prime is t plus e minus e prime. I claim that t is an MST. So first off, is t prime a tree? Well, t is a tree. If you add an edge and remove an edge, it has the same number of edges. So it's got v minus 1 edges, so it is a tree. Is it spanning? Well, t was spanning. So uh, there's a path from every u to v still. But now the path, if u and v are in different parts of the cut, the path from u to v goes through e prime instead of e now. Excuse me, goes through e instead of e prime now, right? So it goes around the long way, but simply by the fact that this was spanning in t, this was spanning in t, now the path is a different bridge. You know, this bridge burned down, you go to this other bridge. There's still a way to connect. So it is spanning. So all that's left for us to show, t is a spanning tree. We just simply need to show that t is a, uh, T prime is a minimal spanning tree. And that's sufficient for us to prove that x is in progress towards a spanning tree. We agree? So now let's do that. What is the weight of T prime? We can actually just simply compute the weight of T prime. And here we mean by weight of T prime to mean the sum of the weights of its edges. This, if T prime is equal to T plus E minus E prime, we know that the weight, the sum of the weights of T prime is equal to the sum of the weights of T plus the sum of the weights, the sum of the edge e, minus the sum of the weight e prime. Do we agree? But what do we know about the relationship between e and e prime? Let me double check this. If e is the smallest edge that we're adding, and e prime is some other edge, then we know that the weight of e must be less than or equal to the weight of e prime, right? So what does that tell us about the relationship between uh, w t prime and w t? We added something small, and then we removed something bigger. So what that means is that the weight of t prime, is this going the right way? Yeah. So the weight of t prime is less than or equal to the weight of t. Right? Yeah? Am, am I defining to be what? Yeah, e prime is some edge. And by assumption, e is the lightest edge. So we know that E is less than or equal to, and by lightest here, I don't mean strictly. It turns out, we'll see in a second, the weight of E. But we know that if this is true for every edge of the cut, because it's the lightest, and E is also, E prime is also in the cut. So the weight of E is less than or equal to any other edge in the cut, including E prime. So given this, given this, we can deduce that T prime is less than uh, T, yeah? Because E is defined to be the lightest edge of the cut. Right? So this is an edge of the cut, so it's less than the edge of that cut, right? Less than or equal to. Yeah? yeah. So 
Sorry, one more time. Yes. So like in the algorithm, yeah, the algorithm would not choose, if there's two edges in a cut, it would not choose the heavier one first. But that's not the premise of the question. The premise is, and we'll finish this in a second, the premise is that there is some MST already. And it is an MST. It's minimal, and it's a spanning, and it's a tree. Right? So if there is some other edge of the cut that has been chosen by the MST algorithm, but there is a lightest edge of the cut, it could only be the case, t is an MST. Here's the conclusion. t is an MST. But this is a spanning tree with weight less than or equal to it. But if this is a minimal spanning tree, we assume this is a correct minimal spanning tree, then it could not be the case that this is strictly less than. It can only be the case that uh, the weight of t prime can only be equal to the weight of t by assumption, and that the weight of e is equal to the weight of e prime. That's the concluding. So actually, by the statement, we know that the weight of t prime is equal to the weight of t. So t is a spanning tree, is a minimum spanning tree. t prime is a spanning tree, but now it's also less than or equal to the weight of a minimum spanning tree. So therefore, t prime must be a spanning tree. And the proof is complete. Right? Now, how do we, any questions on the proof of the cut property? The smallest edge, the lightest edge of any cut must be in some MST. Yeah? So that's an interesting question, and it depends. Because here, uh, it's not true for every cut. But if you suppose, generously, there is a path. Uh, if u and v are in the same vertice, and the path doesn't uniquely cross the cut, then yes. But the MST should connect all elements of uh, the graph, and then may go through the, the edges of a cut. right? So. Unplug, removing an edge of a cut will disconnect something, certainly. Yeah? yeah so let's just think about the cut property first, and then in 30 seconds, we're going to apply the cut property to Kruskal's algorithm. Yeah. Yeah? The definition of a cut is no, has nothing actually to do with it, it being connected, simply that you partition the vertices into two sets and the, you consider the edges that cross it. This is a legal cut. But even though these are disconnected, yeah. This, this ensures that, not, that every cut must contain one edge, but n not exactly one edge. It can have more than one edge in a cut. Um, this is kind of a trivial case, but suppose there is, we, we would do is add an, another edge and then remove one of those edges. Yeah, we're not removing an edge and then considering it, where the net number of edges is still the same. Yes? Uh, the empty set, x is empty. That's not a spanning tree, but that, we agree that is, that is in progress to a spanning tree. Good, good proof for ending out the question. This is kind of a, there's a kind of a proof by contradiction hidden within a proof by induction. It's not a, tr it's not a trivial proof, right? All right, more questions on the cut property before we just, we add the sentence to apply this to Kruskal's algorithm. Uh, here's the inductive step of Kruskal's algorithm. Kruskal's algorithm at each point chooses the lightest edge, right? What do we know about the lightest edge? Every edge is in some cut, right? You can just, if you choose an edge, you can pick a cut around it so that that edge is in a cut, right? So the lightest edge in a graph is the lightest edge in some cut. So the next lightest edge is always the lightest edge of some cut. So choosing the lightest edge each time and adding it to x will be in progress towards an MST. Do you agree? That's why the cut property proves the correctness of Kruskal's, Kruskal's algorithm. Right? Do we see why this applies correctly to Kruskal's algorithm? We, x itself is the, in, inductively in the proof, is itself the steps, the set that is constructed during the execution of the algorithm. You add that lightest edge, which is the lightest edge of some cut. Then you add the lightest edge, again, which is now the lightest edge of some cut, and so on. That's going to guarantee that you're going to have a minimum spanning tree. So it's obviously it outputs a spanning tree, but 
this is sufficient for us to prove that the, spanning tree, that the output of the algorithm is not simply a spanning tree, but a minimum spanning tree. Therefore, Kruskal's algorithm does pr provide an MST. Right? More questions on the, on the totality? Yeah? Yes. The base case would be the set X uh, is, so that you're inducting on the number of elements in X. Well, you start with X is in progress towards some MST, so some edges have been selected. And uh, you start with the empty set. The way the induction actually works is you assume you're at the final step. You remove, you, you want to show N minus 1 implies N. So you simply remove an edge and add an edge. That's how you get back to the tree. Yeah. All right, more questions on the cut property? Uh, it's actually very useful. There's another minimum spanning tree algorithm called Prim's algorithm, which is as trivial as Kruskal's algorithm. Uh, and I think it has a similar runtime. It only has surface level differences. And it also it proves correctness using the cut property. right? So. Cut property, very important, not just for crucial government, but understanding that a lo looking at a local part of the graph can tell you a lot about its structure, right? You can partition it, you can do something with it, 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 it helps you understand quite a lot of it. All right, more questions on the, on, on the on crucial algorithm or the cut property or anything? All right, that's all I have for you today. I'll be around if you have any questions.